Hey, take your Bibles and turn to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. Chris, I'm glad that you explained that you were, you were strumming longer in between verses. I thought my singing was off there for a minute. It was? Okay, well, because I, I was over there and, you know, uh, what was the song? Uncloudy Day. Oh, so he's, he's just a strumming, 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 strumming. And I'm, I'm, I'm going, oh, I sound like a blue tick hound on a tree over there. But here, this is, there's nothing spiritual, but this will help you out if your singing's not quite up to par like mine. Here's what you do. When you mess up singing, like I did, oh, I'm just thinking, look at the person next to you with the look like they messed up. You give them that look like, really? Even though you're the one. It'll help you out. It'll just set you free. Just, just try it. Amen. Thank you for being here at our second service. We've been preaching through um, 2 Thessalonians for a while, and we're going to continue in this. This is some of the most interesting uh, scripture in all of scripture to me because it talks about things in the end time, the order of events. Now, it's not Paul's intent. He's not writing an eschatological uh, letter to inform us about what's going to take place in the end time. Paul's being a pastor. Paul is reaching out to a, uh, a group of believers that are hurting. Uh, so he is offering this truth to comfort them is what he's doing. And um, I think it's safe to say that as Paul gives this rundown of some events, he doesn't give all events, he just mentions some that fits the context uh, of where those Thessalonians are at. I think all of that Paul talks about here really, uh, other than the rapture maybe, I think he, he probably talks about that which fits inside of that seven-year window we call the tribulation period. Um, and uh, he doesn't go into full explanation of what's going to happen, but he does comfort them through this. He's reaffirming to them uh, about what really he's already taught them. So in, in essence, he's reminding them of what they already know, but because of the, the challenges of, of where they're at and, and what's going on in their lives, uh, he has to reaffirm what he's already told them. For instance, he tells them uh, that those who... Are, are related to them who die in Christ, or as he puts it, who fall asleep in Christ. He reassures them that they will be part of the catching away of the church or the rapture. Matter of fact, they're going first uh, before those who are alive. He, he affirms that to them uh, in chapter 2. Or actually, that's in the first letter he writes to them. So, He's told them that the people who are alive when Christ returns, that they too will uh, be called up to meet the Lord in the air after the resurrection of the dead. He's told them that they are not experiencing the great day of the Lord. And if you've been here while we've been teaching and preaching through this, hopefully you know by now that the, that phrase, the day of the Lord, is referring to a single event uh, which has a great run-up to it. There's a lot going on before that actual day happens, but that's a day in which the Lord Jesus Christ will return bodily to earth, and he will enact his wrath. He will defeat his enemies, uh, the enemies of his kingdom. He will put them under his feet, and that's his day. That's the day of the Lord. Uh, they think they're suffering through this because they're suffering for their faith and all, but Paul explains to them they are not and cannot be in the day of the Lord. Because some things has to happen before the day of the Lord can come. He's going to explain that to them uh, today. Uh, he's, he's going to remind us today, as he's already reminded them, that the apostasy, the great falling away, has to take place. And the Antichrist has to be revealed. And the Antichrist, when he's revealed, he'll exalt himself in the rebuilt temple of God. And he will, he will demand that the world worships him as God. And guess what? The world does. And that's the apostasy. And Paul reminds them and affirms to them that all of this has to happen before uh, the day of the Lord. Uh, the rapture comes before the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord cannot come until after the Antichrist is revealed and he sets himself up in the rebuilt temple and demands that the world worships him. This is the order. This is on God's prophetic timetable. This is what sovereign God has declared must happen. None of this can happen outside of that order because God is in control of it. Now, I'm just telling you all this to keep you, 
keep your minds in the right frame that they need to be in as we study this. Um, so we're going to start in verse 6 today because we finished in verse 5, but we're going to read the whole chapter of chapter 2. It won't take long. Just bear with me and listen intently, please. Uh, a lot of this is so important for us because it's in our near future. I believe it's in our very near future, some of what we'll hear today. Starting at verse 1, chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians. You there? Say amen. Paul says, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. By the way, isn't that an incredible thought that one day we will be gathered to the Lord and we will meet the Lord in the air? That is the great hope, by the way, of those who follow Jesus, that this world is not our home. There's coming a day whether we Listen to this. Die in Christ or alive in Christ? I want you to get this thought. When you come to Christ, whether you're dead in Christ or alive in Christ, you're always still in Christ. Isn't that an awesome thought? So we're going to be gathered together to him. Verse 2 says that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by a spirit, a message, or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord had come. Verse 3 says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy, that is a one-time event, the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. That's the Antichrist. Verse 4, He will oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Verse 5, Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one who's coming in accordance with the activity of Satan, with all power, signs, false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. In order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith and truth. It was for this He called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm, hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Let's pray. Master, you were so gracious to us the first service, Lord, and you met with us through your word. Father, you have allowed us a time of worship Father, we have enjoyed testimony this morning from this dear sister who is a missionary. And Father, now we get to the main course, Lord, your word. And God, I would, just, I would just ask Holy Spirit that you again would meet with us through your word. Father, I pray that you open every mind and heart, all ears that are here. Lord, remove all distractions for just a little while. We could focus on the truth of your word. And Lord, Paul said that the Thessalonians were saved by the gospel they preached. God, I pray today as we preach the gospel here, that Lord, you'd save, that you would make new. Lord, that you would bring those whom you've chosen before the foundation of the world to you for salvation today. Father, bring yourself glory, I pray, through this word. 
And may this word be all about you. Lord, I pray that you would restrain me from, Lord, getting carried away and getting into my thoughts and getting on my soapbox. Lord, would you just allow me to preach your word for all that it is in Jesus' name. And all of God's hands said, amen. Amen. So starting in verse 6, after he tells them, he reminds them actually in verse 5, look, I've already told you these things. You know these things. Because when Paul led them to the Lord, he told them about these events, obviously, that would unfold in the latter times. Verse 6, he says, and you know what restrains him now. Well, who is him? Well, him is the same subject, the subject of the Antichrist, the son of destruction, as he calls him, uh, the lawless or the man of lawlessness. Paul says in verse 6, and you know what restrains him from now. Now, this letter was written in the first century. This is an old, old, old letter. And so this truth reminds us that the Antichrist rising up even had to be restrained in the first century. Had he not been restrained, he would have already been on the scene. But there's something restraining him. There's something stopping him. There's something that's keeping him from carrying out his wicked plans and carrying out his wicked goals and doing all the things that he desires to do, which is to overthrow God and overtake God. And verse 6 says, you know, he, he, he tells the Thessalonians, you already know who he is. You already know what is restraining Antichrist. So this is not a new thought. This is a very old thought. This is not something that, that's... The starting to, or the desires to start now, this is something that has always been in play. And, and Paul says, you know what restrains him. So what does restrain him? What stops the, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, this superman that is energized and empowered by Satan? What stops him from showing up today? What stops him from showing up tomorrow? How didn't he come in the, why didn't he come in the 18th century? Why didn't he come in the 15th century, uh, the 20th century? Why ain't he here today in the 21st century? There's something that's stopping him. Well, what is it? Well, there's a lot of different ideas about this. A lot of different ideas. Some say it's the church. I don't know. Some say it's the nation Israel. Some say it's the Archangel Michael. Some say it's the Holy Spirit. Very well could be. Some say uh, that it's lots and lots of things. There's lots of ideas about what is restraining uh, this this man of lawlessness, this uh, son of of destruction. By the way, aren't there, those are some really revealing titles. Man of lawlessness. That, that, that means that Antichrist will have nothing to do with law. Not man's law, not God's law. The, the man of sin will have nothing to do with that. He is the son of destruction. He desires destruction because that's all he knows because he's energized by Satan. And and there's something that's stopping him from bursting on the scene today. There was something that was stopping him from bursting on the scene in Paul's day. And Paul just simply calls it a restrainer. What is that? Well, I believe uh, it's just simply God. It's just sovereign God. Maybe the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the third person of the Trinity, God too, Maybe it's the Holy Spirit, but it's God in His sovereign plans and His sovereign ways and His sovereign power that will not allow this Antichrist to burst onto the scene. He is stopping him. Why does He restrain him? Because God has a prophetic calendar, God has a prophetic timetable. Anything that Satan desires to do, anything that Satan is capable of doing has to work inside the limits of sovereign God. 
In other words, God has to permit him. God has to give him permission. God has to move out of his way before he can enact anything that he has. Any desires that he has, any plans, any goals cannot operate outside of God's sovereignty. It has to operate inside of God's sovereignty. God has to allow him to do that. And God has a prophetic timetable. And all of the events that, that, that Paul has been talking about, the, 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 the gathering of the saints or the rapture as we call it, the day of the Lord, the revealing of the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation, which is Antichrist, setting himself up in the rebuilt temple, the great apostasy where the world will turn and face the Antichrist and declare and agree that he is God. All of that works inside of God's sovereign timetable, God's prophetic calendar, if you will. And none of it can operate outside of that because God is sovereign. How sovereign is God? God is sovereign over every atom, every molecule that exists in the universe. Nothing happens outside of God's sovereign decree or him allowing it to happen. So he restrains. He's the restrainer. God is restraining Antichrist from bursting onto the scene. In verse 7, the, the Antichrist is, uh, I'm sorry, the restrainer uh, uh, is said to be a he. He uses the pronoun he. It's not a she. It can't be the church. The church is a she. The church is a bride. It's a he. Could be Holy Spirit because he is identified in Scripture as he. Could be God. Yeah, it's God. God is restraining this, this man, this evil uh, person who would have his way. And by the way, that phrase, taken out of the way, don't, don't let it lead you astray. It just simply means a stepping aside or a getting out of the way. It's not like something makes it move. It's sovereign God deciding now is the time for me to release the floodgates of hell on this planet. And that's exactly what happens. That's exactly what's going on. So God's timeline is met when the restrainer is moved or, or when the restrainer is removed, steps out of the way, and the son of destruction, the one who is the Antichrist, will be revealed, uh, and his destructive plans will unfold across the planet, and all hell will be released. released. What, what empowers the Antichrist? Now, the Antichrist is identified as the one who will come in our future. He is Satan's Superman. But Scripture declares that there are many Antichrists now. And the word is self-defining. It is just anything opposite of God, opposite of Christ, opposite of God's word. Matter of fact, in 1 John chapter 4, I would encourage you to turn there. I want to show you a Scripture uh, that's very informing about what's going on. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. Give you just a second to get there. You got it? Okay. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. John says this. He says, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And then he gives it a title. The spirits that does not confess God, that are not from God, do not confess his son, this is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming. And then John says, and now is already in the world. That spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. Well, how long has it been here? It's been here ever since Satan got kicked out of heaven. It's been here ever since Satan rebelled against God and got booted out of heaven and was cast to earth. It was here at the fall of man. Matter of fact, it was the catalyst for the fall of man. Uh, Paul says in Romans that by one man, sin entered the world and death with it. 
Now, we usually regard that as physical death. The physical death is actually just the end game of our spiritual death. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them in perfection. They walked with him. They talked with him. They communed with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Had not sin entered the world, we would still be walking and talking and communion with God. Amen? Spiritual death brought physical death. But there was a catalyst to all of that. John gives it the name spirit of antichrist. It is everything opposite of God. It is a spirit, obviously, from the evil one uh, that is what empowers, that what, it's what brings about all of these things that we see going on uh, in our planet. Uh, the spirit of antichrist is working now. It was working then. It has never not been here. It has always been around. It's what uh, caused Eve to look at the fruit that was forbidden. And scripture says, when she saw the fruit was pleasing. She had never seen the fruit as pleasing. She had always seen the fruit as forbidden. But when she finally saw it in an opposite light or a different light, than what God had constructed, the world came crashing down. Disobedience. That's what the spirit of Antichrist does. It does everything opposite of God. It promotes everything opposite of God. We live in a world today that's full of movements, that's full of uh, isms, <laughs> that's full of uh, all kind of things that are going on we, we're witnessing in our world. And... Uh, what promotes all of that? What energizes all of that? Spirit of Antichrist. Shortly after Adam and Eve was removed from the Garden of Eden, they started a family, and it didn't take long for that family to get dysfunctional. Matter of fact, real quick, the oldest son murdered his brother. Now, what caused Cain to have that murderous thought? What, what, what in the world would put that in Cain's? Uh, nothing had ever been murdered uh, except... Uh, what had been uh, sacrificed for Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness that we know of, what, what in the world promoted and, 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 and caused Cain to have a thought where I'll just take his life? And what took it to the next level where it no longer was a thought, it was actually at the end of his hands it became an action, and he did the deed, and he, he rose up and slew his brother in the field. What did that? The same spirit that now works that has always worked to promote and energize and empower evil thoughts and evil ways. Paul talks about this in this passage. He reminds us of some things. In verse uh, 7, he says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Again, first century letter. This has been going on for 2,000 years. It's been going on a lot longer than that. It's been going on since man arrived. It's been going on longer than that. It's been going on before man alive, uh, arrived. This mystery of lawlessness. Well, why would Paul call this a mystery of, of lawlessness? What, what's, what's so mysterious about it? Well, perhaps you, like me, have watched what's going on in our society all of the things that is just unraveling our world, we're, we're basically having a meltdown. Uh, everything's coming unraveled. Uh, have you noticed that in society, our society is incapable of understanding what's going on? Our society has an unwillingness to state the obvious. When you turn your TVs on and in local cities they're marching in the streets and they're burning down buildings, they're demanding their rights and they're acting out and, and law has no effect on them. And then you listen to the 5 o'clock news and you don't hear anyone say on the news that this is a sin. You don't hear anyone call it wickedness. Matter of fact, you actually now, we've come so far down that you actually see the broadcasters, the newscasters and all, uh, kind of rewarding them for it and kind of claiming that it's their, it's their God-given right to protest like that. Uh, 
What is the deal with that? Do you, like me, find yourself scratching your head and say, is no one paying attention? Is there no one willing to state the obvious that these people are wicked? They're full of the devil. They're energized by, by, by a demonic spirit. It's the spirit of Antichrist. And the reason that Paul says is it's a mystery of lawlessness. And by the word, that word lawlessness, it's self-defining as well. It's an unwillingness to follow the law. Antichrist, his, his title is man of lawlessness. And so we're living in a society now where we're running up to that place where in the future at some point there will be a world leader who will have nothing to do with law. Not God's law, not man's law. And, and we're, being, we're being prepped for that. I don't know if you're paying attention, but the world is coming to that place where laws don't matter. Uh, whatever the law is, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll, we'll look the other way. We'll do uh, anything but what it says. And, and our society has an incredible unwillingness to state the fact. Anything that is unknown is a mystery. And here we are in the 21st century, we're watching the world come unraveled, and no one is stating the obvious. We make jokes about crooked politicians. We joke about the LGBTQ movement. That, that's kind of our silly little response nowadays. We joke about things where it's not funny. It's not funny at all. And were it not for the restrainer, the gates of hell would have already flung open. And that, that which is Satan's Superman, the Antichrist, would already have burst onto the scene. Matter of fact, he would have done it a long, long time ago. But there is, praise the Lord, someone who is restraining him. Verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. What does that mean? That means as we live out our lives in the 21st century, this spirit of Antichrist is already and has been for some time working uh, in and around our culture, dealing with, with all of these movements. All of these movements that you see, all of them are energized by that spirit of Antichrist that we've been talking about. And when he's no longer restrained, he will completely take over. He will completely have his way uh, and do what he wants to do, which is to set himself up as God. Now, how should we look at this? How, how should we understand all this? Because the Bible's clear on this. The Bible's clear uh, that there is a restrainer that is holding back that Antichrist who will at some point come on the scene. There is a, a mystery of lawlessness that has been at work and is at work. Uh, and, and that restrainer in verse 7 says he's going to keep on restraining until he is taken out of the way. So when God's timeline is met, God will step out of the way. The floodgates of hell will be flung open. The Antichrist will burst on the scene. And all of the things that we read about in Revelation during the great tribulation period will Will, burst, will, will happen immediately. And, and think about it, seven years. And really the, the, the worst part of the tribulation as we see in Scripture is only the last three and a half years, the great tribulation. All of this can happen in three years. Three years is not a long time. We're, we're, we're about to baptize here in a minute my, my oldest grandson. I think he's 10 years old. Is that correct, Mama? Yeah. Uh, man, I remember when they bought, brought the little rascal home. Seems like it was yesterday. Now he's 10 years old. Look, time flies, amen or not. I mean, I've got clothes I still wear from the 80s. That'll set some of you men free. You've been wanting to wear them tube socks, but you just, you're just afraid somebody's going to make fun of you. You get all in your feelings. Look, put them dudes on, pull them up to your kneecaps, and proudly wear them tube socks. <laughs> Elizabeth's like, don't you ever wear tube socks. You and my wife's going to get along great, Elizabeth. Wayne calls me coach because I wear socks that come up to my calves. You know, you know, what's the deal, man? It's socks. They're functional. 
Now, I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus, you can wear them tube socks. All you men who's got them in the drawer, stuck down there on the bottom, your wife wants to throw them around, away, but you remember. First time you took her out, you had them socks on. She liked them then. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> Don't you let that woman throw them socks away. What am I doing here? I, I was doing so good. <laughs> now I'm on tube socks. We're, we went from the Antichrist to tube socks. Just like that. Pray me back, boys. Pray me back. <laughs> well, I'm just making the point. Time flies. Listen, I'm 54 years old. I have been here in all of my life. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Here's what I know about that today. I'm 54 years closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is coming. And we see so clearly in Scripture how it lays out and what we will see. We are watching lawlessness take over our land. We're watching it every day. Latest thing, guy writes a song about it. Everybody loses their mind. Yeah. We live in a world of lawlessness. But you ain't seen nothing yet. You haven't seen anything yet. So as we close out, how, how, do, how do we look at all of this? Uh, as a body of believers, as an individual Christian, what, what, what do we do with this? We're not going to be a part of it. Scripture is clear, the church will be removed. So what do we do with this? Well, the Bible declares that we are children of light and children of the day. Uh, that just simply means that none of this should catch us by surprise. We should look at what's going on in our society and we should identify it for what it is. We should understand what it is because we live in the light of God's Word. We live in the truth of God's Word. And so none of this should uh, catch us unaware. We should not be living as though this is a mystery to us. It's not a mystery to us. Number one, we should understand that God is sovereignly in control of all things. Nothing happens outside of his divine allowance. Nothing. God's in control. Number two, understand that as we see lawlessness continue to rise... Make sure you agree with God's Word so that this is not a mystery to you and your family. Now, listen to me. To agree with God's Word means you know what God's Word says. Amen? To agree with God's Word means you're familiar with God's Word. I am absolutely convinced that one of Satan's greatest tactics is to get all of God's people more busy than they ought to be. Because when you're too busy to get into God's Word, you're just too busy. I bumped into a guy the other day at the fuel pumps. He's in town from Georgia. Uh, they're putting them solar panels out there south of town. And I invited him to church. And he said, man, I'll just tell you, we work six days a week. And uh, that Sunday, boy, if we get a Sunday, I, I just got to rest. Man, look, feller, if you're living outside of God's Word and outside of God's kingdom, rest ain't what you need. Uh, you don't need to be laying around trying to catch up your, on your sleep on Sunday. And I told him, I said, look, come on to Cowboy Church. I'll put you to sleep. You can sleep right there in front of me. Folks do it all the time. Matter of fact, there's one over there right now asleep. Don't look. That's what I told him. I said, come on to Cowboy Church, man. I'll put you sound to sleep. But maybe you'll catch something from God's Word. We're all way too busy. Listen to me, parents. I know you're busy, man, and, and I know we live in... Y'all are always getting mad at me, but you got to forgive me before you even do it. We live in this culture where we got to keep up with everybody. Have you noticed that? Birthday parties. Good Lord, man. When was... What happened to a cake being enough? Now we got to fill our yard full of blow-up stuff. We're mixing water and electricity together. We're putting our kids in danger anyway with that stuff. Man, we got to have the biggest birthday party because they had a big and down the road. Ours has got to be bigger because old Bobby's turning six. Bobby ain't going to remember that. Somebody say amen. Shame the devil. 
You had to drag it out of you, didn't you? Somebody in here right now has got a birthday party scheduled. They done spent $4,000 on it. <laughs> and they're convicted over that birthday party. Man, in the name of Jesus, tell them you love them. Bake them a cake and tell them to go mow the yard. <laughs> Set them free. But that ain't where we're at, man. We're in that culture. We got to compete. Our kids has got to win. Let me be real with you a minute. They won't remember most of their birthdays. And if you want to spend $12,000 on them, it's your money. It's your kid. Chances are they won't remember. But let me tell you something they are going to do. They're going to spend eternity somewhere. And God's word is eternal. And I'm convinced that Satan has got us so busy we can't even raise our children in the fear of the Lord because we got them out doing so much at all times. Let me ask you a real question, parents. You ever think your kids get tired and just want to be kids? They just want to go play in the dirt, eat the dirt, feed them a little dirt. So understand that... Um, lawlessness as we see it rising and it's going to continue to rise make sure you're in agreement with god's word make sure you're familiar with god's word when the next evil movement rises up and marches identify it for what it is that's empowered by the spirit of antichrist don't be afraid to say that when the next evil and wicked law becomes the law of the land make sure you identify that that's empowered by by the spirit of antichrist when the next wicked trend becomes social norms make sure you identify that as the spirit of antichrist working in our land when the next attack comes on absolute truth the church the preaching of the word of god make sure you identify that as empowered and energized uh, by the spirit of antichrist don't let that be a mystery to you. Don't scratch your head and say, boy, I wonder what's going on. Wonder what's going on in the White House. Wonder what's going on with our politicians. Wonder what's going on in our society. It should not be a mystery to God's people. The Bible is clearly telling us that the spirit of Antichrist prevails in the land. The Bible clearly is telling us that there is a lawlessness that is running rampant amongst us, and we need to understand what it's all about. We need to identify it for all it is it's empowered by the spirit of antichrist no matter if it's wearing a suit and standing in congress no matter if it's wearing a suit and standing in the senate no matter if it's wearing a suit and sitting in the oval office if he's doing evil deeds if he's anti-god he's empowered by the spirit of antichrist god's people ought to stand up and name it for what it is It doesn't matter if it's protesting in the streets or demanding. It's their body and their choice. If they're anti-God, anti-God's word, they're empowered by the spirit of antichrist. No matter if they stand in the pulpit and yet preach a gospel that is contrary to God's word, they're empowered by antichrist and God's people or to be familiar enough with God's Word. It's in black and white that we can identify it, that we can label it, that we can warn others that they are empowered by the spirit of Antichrist. Lastly, make sure you're ready. Make sure you're ready for that gathering day. In Genesis chapter 4, there's a great flood that takes place. And the Bible says that every thought of every man was only continually wicked in all things. It was the most evil time this planet has ever known. And God destroyed it. But before he destroyed that world, he allowed an old boy named Noah to preach for 120 years. Every naysayer that come by, Noah kept a hammering. Every liberal, 
that came by. Noah kept a sawing. Everybody that called him a fool, Noah kept a measuring. Noah kept a working. Because God had clearly said to Noah, I'm going to drown this world. I want you to build a boat. In theology, that ark is a pre-type of Christ. It's an Old Testament picture of Jesus Christ. Noah's preaching was warning that there's going to be a flood come. Why, you old fool, ain't even never rain. What are you talking about? It's going to flood the world. I just wonder how many people has sat under God's word and rejected it. That when the gathering of the saints come and the church is removed and they're left here, that the Bible is going to become so vividly real to them. They'll remember that old preacher preaching his guts out on Sunday. They'll remember that mama who begged them to go to church, begged them to trust Jesus. They'll remember that family who served the Lord, but they were unwilling to have anything to do with it. And they'll experience the flood, but it's not a flood of water. It's a flood of wickedness. It's a flood of evil. Literally, when God steps out of the gate, and the restrainer that restrains removes himself, the gates of hell will fling open. And the wickedness that the Antichrist will usher in, there won't be anyone to stop it. And all those that have rejected the gospel, they'll be here and they'll remember of all the opportunities that righteous God offered them. All the opportunities, all the sermons, all the people that shared three circles, (laughs) they'll remember all of that but they will be ensued and drowned in wickedness and all that the tribulation period has to offer. Make yourself ready. Listen to this preacher. Make yourself ready. Dads, get your house in order. Make sure you've got time for God's Word. Make sure you're investing amongst all the other things you invest in your children. Make sure you're investing God's Word. Set aside Sunday as a day for the Lord. Set aside Sunday as a time to be in God's house. I know there's things that pull us away. There's times I'm not here. We're not legalists. We're not, we don't live under a law. But make this a priority. I'm baptizing my grandson this Sunday. He's 10 years old. Next Sunday, I'll baptize a couple of more young folks. The, the 14th of uh, August, I believe it is, I'll, I'll baptize another young lady that got saved at our our rodeo as the gospel was preached. God uses his church to instill his kingdom word, his kingdom values into his children. Make sure, parents, you got your children in church. Nothing else is more of a priority than getting your children under the God's word. Let Let me just tell you that when your kids go over there to the kids' barn, they are being taught the word of God. You can't give them a better investment. I don't care how many saddles and horses and ball bats and ropes and basketballs and roller skates you buy for them. There is no greater investment than what's going on right over there in that kids' barn today. And the salvations that we're seeing in these young lives is a result of teachers investing the Word of God into them. It's just that important. There is no greater influence in a child's life than a mom and a dad. And when that mom and dad is vested in God's Word and they're passing that on to them, they're doing what God's called them to do and blessed them to do. Make sure your house is in order. The Lord's coming. The restrainer won't restrain forever. And when his prophetic timeline is met, there is no turning back. And all that God's word has said will happen, will happen. As a follower of Jesus, make sure you're familiar so that you won't live in a mystery You'll be able to understand all of the lawlessness. You'll label the lawlessness. You'll call it out, and you'll point through that lawlessness others to the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen or not. 
Well, hello, everybody. My name is Tracy Wilson. Thank you so much for being with us uh, via Facebook or YouTube or however you're watching us, whether it be a Wednesday night round pen or a Sunday morning uh, service here at the Cowboy Church. Just wanted to say hello and give you a personal invite to come and be with us here at the Cowboy Church. Uh, there's three options for you. Sunday mornings, we have a 9 a.m. service, uh, and then a second service at 10.30 a.m. And then on Wednesday nights, uh, we do what we call a round pen Bible study, which is just getting into the heart of God's Word and studying it for all it's worth. We would love to meet with you uh, here in person at the Cowboy Church. We're so thankful for uh, technology. We've gotten uh, comments on our uh, sermons and Bible studies uh, all the way from Africa. And so we're so thankful. But uh, we do want to invite you here with us uh, to be uh, in person, in-house at the Cowboy Church. You know, the Bible says this about salvation. The Bible says clearly in Ephesians 2.8 that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, so no man can boast. Our prayer is that through these messages and through these Bible studies uh, that the Word of God would uh, find its place in your heart. The promise is that God's Word will not return void. So we want to make ourselves available to you uh, for anything that we can do to help you. If you have questions about this Jesus that we preach about, this Jesus that we serve, this Jesus that we know as our Savior and that the Bible declares as the only Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. If you would have a question about that, if we could help you with that, or if God deals with your heart through one of our sermons or Bible studies, and you've responded to that, and you've put your hope and trust, and you've committed to follow Jesus Christ, we would love to celebrate with you about that. We'd love to talk with you about that help you in any way that we can. If you're watching, then obviously you have Facebook or uh, the availability of YouTube. Uh, if we can do anything, I would love for you to personally message me on Facebook, and I would love to correspond with you about this. God is able, and He is able to meet all of our needs. He has extended His grace to us uh, through the offer of forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. I hope that you have taken advantage of that. I hope that you belong to Christ. And please take advantage of Three Trees Cowboy Church. Being here in person or just allowing us to message with you and help you in any way we can. Until then, until we see you in person or we see that message, God bless you and thank you for being with us.